Hey everybody, John Lorden here. Welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch for today, October 20th, 2017. Hope you're all having a nice week. Um, this one is a little bit different. First, I have to give a very big thank you to Christy Straysinger for doing a bunch of research on this case. Um, this one's a little interesting because originally we were discussing this being an episode of Case Cracked. And uh, I had Christy do some research. She sent it over and I went through it. And by the time I got to the bottom, I just couldn't decide if this case was really cracked or not. So that is essentially what the mystery is going to be in today's brain scratch. By the time we get to this, to the end of this video, um, I honestly, I, at this point, I don't know if I'm going to have a conclusion if I really think that this case has been cracked or not. Um, and I think many of you out there, judging on some uh, comment threads that I've seen about this case, I'm sure some of you out there are going to feel one way and others of you are going to feel another. Um, it's just, it's a really kind of mysterious case that I haven't seen uh, conclude in quite, quite this fashion before. So um, let's jump into it and figure it out together. Today we are talking about the case of Martha Jean Lambert. And this is a case that originally started as a missing persons case. Uh, since then, there has been some developments, and it looks like it could indeed be a murder case, but that's part of the question that I still have here. Um, this is a photograph of young Martha Jean Lambert. And if we jump over to the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, um, we can see they have their missing persons page here. And thankfully, it looks like in this county, they don't have a lot of missing persons. Uh, as a matter of fact, it looks like the oldest one that is um, still active on this page is October 27th of 1979, Mr. Wilson J. Mickler here. But if we scroll down to the bottom, um, it's kind of interesting that there's one on here that says it's solved. The rest of them don't say they're solved, so I kind of assume that this was active cases. Are they perhaps as confused as I am about is this case really closed out or not? I don't know, maybe, but here's the description. Martha Jean Lambert was reported missing in 1985, but her family keeps hope. In November 1985, Martha Jean Lambert, a 12-year-old student at Ketter Linus Junior High School in St. Augustine, Florida, disappeared from her mobile home on Cary Lynn Road. After school, Martha went to a friend's house. About 7.30 p.m., she went home alone. After eating with her brother, Martha told him she was going out. Martha has not been seen since that time. This case is being kept open as a runaway or possible homicide. Um, and once again, you can just see from the picture, they've added the word solved on it. But many of these questions that are brought up in this synopsis are still, um, I think they're still valid. Now, this version of the story, this is the only page that I can find this version of the story, um, including some type of time frame. In most retellings of this story, we don't even really have a good time frame of when she, she had disappeared from home. Um, and this did happen on Thanksgiving, which I don't think they even note here. Um, and this whole thing about her eating with her brother and then telling him that she was going out. I really haven't been able to find another source that supports that version of the story at all. So I'm not exactly sure what the source is for this version of the story. Uh, let's take a quick look at St. Augustine, Florida, just to learn about where this is taking place. It's a city in the southeastern United States on the Atlantic coast of northeastern Florida. Uh, the city's population, as of the 2010 census, was just over 12,000. But if you look at it historically, even back in the 80s, uh, it was around 12,000 back at that time as well. And here on the map, we can see this whole shape is actually uh, St. John's County. So that's why they blew it up to this size where we can see uh, the actual city of St. Augustine in there. And I want to give a very big shout out to um, staugustine.com or staugustine.com. They did a lot of news coverage on this. We're going to look at a lot of their information as we're going through this. Um, this first article we're looking at is actually from 19 years after um, she had gone missing, but there's a lot of great details in here that quite honestly, I didn't find anywhere else. So let's take a look at this together. Um, this was posted on November 28th, 2004. 
The mother is convinced her 12-year-old daughter, Martha Jean Lambert, was abducted from the street outside her St. Augustine house 19 years and one day ago. An investigator who has studied the case is almost as sure that the little girl is dead, possibly killed on the day she disappeared. Martha was a happy little girl who was looking forward to visiting relatives her family remembers. People who knew her also said Martha was a girl who was friendly, but always dirty, a victim of screaming abuse at home, a little girl with an odd family. Uh, I've seen several mentions to the type of home that she was living in. It doesn't sound like it was a very easy place. Uh, I've also heard that there was potentially some abuse happening from a neighbor in particular, but I don't have a whole lot of details on that, so I really don't want to name that person, but uh, a bit of a troubled upbringing that is going on in this area. A neighbor said her brothers were, quote, kind of strange. Her father, an alcoholic, was 74 at the time of her disappearance. Her mother was only 33. Since she's been missing, her father has died. Her mother has had two nervous breakdowns, and one of her brothers now goes by the name Cynthia Jean Lambert. Investigator Chuck West, a major at the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, is searching for clues. Quote, there is a strong possibility she was the victim of a homicide at the hands of someone close to her, West said last week. Martha Jean Lambert, a 12-year-old Keterlinus Junior High School 7th grader, disappeared 19 years ago from her mobile home on Cary Lynn Road. Um, the day before, sorry, so I was incorrect. It's the day before Thanksgiving, November 27th, 1985. The blonde blue eyed girl was last seen at dusk walking away from her family's trailer wearing a two piece bathing suit. Martha was four foot eight inches and weighed only 70 pounds. Those involved don't agree much on the rest of the story. The family members each have different ideas. The detectives also have varying theories. After Martha disappeared, the family was torn apart. Uh, Pishon, recently remarried, and formerly Margaret Lambert, that's her mother, said after Martha was gone, fighting increased between her and her husband, Martha's father, Howard Lambert. It broke her dad and I up, Pishon said. He was too much into alcohol. Pishon's two sons, both older than Martha, have been in trouble with the law. The father died while still living on Cary Lynn Road. Martha's, Martha's older brothers, David Lambert and Raymond Lambert, are in Florida. In 2002, the sheriff's office received a tip that Martha's body may be buried by State Road 207. They used radar equipment to search the area but found nothing. Construction may have covered the grave if there is one. We're going to get a lot more into that area in particular and what happened in that area and why there was all this construction. Quote, I still remember her last words. Mom, I'm going over. I'll be back in five minutes. Uh, Pishon was at a neighbor's house with her daughter for a social gathering shortly before the girl disappeared. When Martha didn't return to the social, her mother went looking for her. When she walked up to the family trailer, her son walked out laughing, she said. It bothers me that my youngest boy wouldn't tell me what he was laughing about, Pishon said. She said the boys were both devastated when Martha didn't come back. A little bit interesting there. And as we progress in this, um, it, one of the brothers is certainly a person of interest in this case and maybe more, as you'll see by the time we get to the end of this. West interviewed Martha's brother, David Lambert, the night she disappeared. He was 14 at the time. First, the teenager told the sheriff's office that he saw Martha get into a black vehicle. The story didn't hold, West said. He then said he last saw her walking down the street to go to the Little Champ on State Road 207. He was covering or protecting something, West said. Pishon agrees her son may know something he has never been able to say. She fears he may have been threatened by the people who abducted her daughter. David Lambert called the sheriff's office in 2000, wanting to talk about Martha. I seen her walk off into the dark, David Lambert said in the interview with the sheriff's office. He was the last person to see her that day, and she still lingers vividly in his mind. The two were close, he said. Raymond Lambert, 34, is the oldest of the three siblings. Uh, he now signs his name Cynthia Jean Lambert. Where he was on the day Martha disappeared is not clear. His mother said he was at church. His brother told detectives in 2000 that he doesn't remember. Uh, just to make some clarification here, 
Um, she did say, I believe, that the boy that was laughing was, okay, it was the youngest boy that wouldn't say what he was laughing about. So that would be David. That would not be Raymond. Well, let's keep that in mind. Um, after Martha disappeared, Pishon said she got a call with a girl's voice saying, Mom, I'm okay, but it didn't sound like Martha. What a terrible, terrible thing to happen. Uh, I don't know if this is someone pulling a prank. I don't know if this is someone that's involved in her disappearance trying to throw her off in some way, but um, I just, I can't believe someone would make that phone call. Pashan keeps a picture of her daughter around a favorite mug. Another cup has the age progressed photo of Martha. Soccer, singing, country music, fried potatoes, spaghetti are all reminders of her daughter's favorite things. We've spent hundreds and hundreds of man hours on this case, Wes said. It's been worked on by at least half a dozen detectives. The case is bizarre, he said. And West wouldn't be the last detective on the case. It will get reassigned again, uh, as we'll learn in a few moments here. I want to stop at truecrimereport.com. This is another write-up on the case. Um, I just want to cover this one aspect to it. Shortly after Martha went missing, a neighbor claimed she spotted two men in a green van roaming the, through the neighborhood. Martha's mother was convinced they'd taken her daughter, but when police followed the lead, they found nothing. Margaret says she still believes that the men in the green van took her daughter. And I've heard her quoted as talking about that. So I wanted to be sure to tell you guys that aspect of it as well. Heading over to another article at staugustine.com, we can see a very strong title here, posted January 2nd, 2010, Cold Case Solved After 24 Years. Brother Admits Responsibility in Disappearance. I'm sure you can guess which brother we're talking about here, David A. Lambert. Lambert, who was 14 when his sister disappeared, has consistently been a strong suspect according to investigators' files. Sheriff's Office detectives Sean M. Tice and Howard F. Skip Cole III took a last crack at the cold case in June. Uh, that would be June of 2009. They talked to acquaintances, family members, and neighbors who had lived around the Lambert's trailer on Cary Lynn Road. Several suggested the detectives should talk to David Lambert again. We talked to him for 20 some hours, said Tice. David Lambert said he had wanted to get out of the house to get away from his father's yelling about their burned Thanksgiving turkey. David and Martha Jean walked to the abandoned Florida Memorial College at the corner of King Street and Holmes Boulevard. The school had been closed for years. Windows were missing in the empty buildings. Debris was strewn around the grounds, chunks of cinder block, metal shards, discarded wood, and glass. Quote, it was like a poor kid's Disney World, said Cole. They would go in there a lot and play. David Lambert had already given his sister $20 to take to a neighborhood store. She spent a little over $4 and gave him the change. At the abandoned school, Martha Jean asked her brother for another $20. When he refused, she punched him in the face, Lambert told Tice. He said he got mad and shoved her. She fell backward, a piece of metal sticking out of the ground impaled her in the base of her skull. Now remember, this is all information that is coming from David. Um, we don't have any physical evidence to support this at this point, but the investigators seem pretty convinced about this. Um, as you'll see. Tice gave David Lambert a present as that interview began. Quote, I framed that picture of his sister. I wrapped it, he said. He kind of opens it up and stands it up next to him. After he told us everything, he picked it up and he cleaned every inch of it. Cruz immediately went out to search the college. The grounds were sectioned off into four five acre zones and searched by a half dozen canines trained in detecting human remains. A backhoe operator futilely scratched away at a piece of ground that got the dog's attention. The searchers found no sign of Martha Jean Lambert. The state attorney's office reviewed the report and decided manslaughter would have been the most appropriate charge. According to the media release, changes in the law since 1985, statute of limitations, the suspect's age at the time, and other mitigating circumstances would preclude charges from being filed. So... If David did indeed do this and did indeed admit to this and he is telling the truth, um, there's nothing that's going to happen to him at this point.
we'll just keep that in mind as, as we're going forward here. Tyson Cole brought Lambert's mother to the sheriff's office so he could describe what he had done to his sister. The detectives got reflective in recalling the scene. It was real emotional, Cole said. We all sort of speculated that she always knew, but she was going to protect her son, which is natural. But the truth is, based on her reaction, it seemed like genuine surprise. When she heard, it was definite raw emotion. So at this point, do we have a case cracked? If we just stopped the episode right here, um, just let me know where where would you guys be at, at this point? Uh, we have what seems like a confession. They go looking for physical evidence to support that. They can't find it because basically this college has been um, tore down and all the ground has been re-leveled. They can't find any indication of Martha anywhere. They look for 20, I mean, they block it. They do a 20 acre block and they still can't find anything related to Martha. Let's learn a little bit more about this college area and what happened there. This is another article from staugustine.com, but not really related to the case. It's in particular about the campus. It's called A Campus Vanished. Uh, County code officials say buildings on the site were torn down in 1997 after fires and complaints of prostitutes and drug dealers plying their trades on the property. Uh, Let me bring up a map for you guys real quick so you can see what we're talking about. This is uh, the intersection Holmes and King. And this is even Google still has a, um, a mark in here for the Florida Memorial College. But this has all gone through renovation. I believe this block here used to be where these buildings were that, that are being talked about. Um, I believe this fire station that's over on this side is original. That was part of the college campus and has been leased back to the city. So it could be used as a regular fire department now. Um, this area might have also been part of the campus. I can't get a very good idea, but I know um, that the school also owns some of the land down here, some of the land over here, and uh, I think even some of the land going up this uh, Tekoi Road. But for development that has changed there significantly, I'm pretty sure we're looking at this block or potentially this area here, which you can see is actually currently being developed. And there's a really weird thing where if you actually go to the street view here um, and take a look over there, you're going to see a bunch of trees. But as soon as we go to satellite view, you're going to see that it is all... Uh, It looks like it's all been leveled at this point. I believe this satellite view is more recent than the street view that we're seeing down there. Uh, I I can't believe that the satellite view would be that old that you would have trees that look like they have been there for decades. So if that's the case, this might have just been more of the woods type of land. And I would bet that most of the school was over, uh, over here. But outside of that, we can also see this little walking trail of blue dots here. And I wanted to show you uh, where they would have walked from their home. Carrie Lynn Road is down over here. And it's about a 1.4 mile walk. So a little bit of a walk that they would have taken there. Back to the article at St. Augustine, which, by the way, this article is essentially about a group of alumni that were hoping to renovate this college and kind of bring it back in some way. Uh, Karen Bruner, a county code enforcement officer, said the structures were all in poor condition. Homeless people were living in the buildings and people were using it as a dump. For safety purposes, they needed to come down, Bruner said. Besides being a nuisance, it was a hazard. There are a lot of children in the area. Once again, this is not an article about the actual case, but if what we're hearing from David is indeed true, um, it could be that this place was dangerous enough that there was an accident between him and his sister having a little bit of an argument and her getting hurt on some debris in this place. Um, And just to give you a little backstory on this college, it was originally a junior college. In 1963, it changed its name to Florida Memorial College. The main entrance to the campus still exists at the corner of Holmes and King Street. The arch that stands there is a symbol of the school and the name of its yearbook. Um, The atmosphere there became difficult for the school during the civil rights era. The Klan was active then. Twice a week, a Klan member would telephone and threaten to attack the woman's dormitory. Uh, Male students armed with sticks would then stand guard all night. So 
this place had a bad kind of mojo about it. I mean, we're talking, this was through the mid 1960s and then 20 years later with what happens to Martha. Um, if we just take one more look here, I just wanna show you the arch that they're mentioning. You can see it if we drop in right on the corner. Um, right there, this arch. Let's get a little better view of it here for you. And you can see it says Florida Memorial College. So uh, I'm assuming that whatever happened to her happened to her, if David's telling the truth, somewhere back here. So I don't want to take too much of a divergence from the main story, but just to let you know, that's the history of what happened on that particular piece of land. As you can see from the street view we're looking at, it's been pretty significantly renovated. Um, for me, I still have to wonder about what type of detail did he give them about where he buried her? According to what they say he said, um, after he figured that she was dead, he found a piece of a sign and used that to dig about a three foot grave. Um, what I'm curious about is why are they looking through all 20 acres if they have a pretty precise location? I mean, uh, and that's part of the trouble that I have, even with what we've heard them say, he said, there aren't, there isn't a very good level of detail in terms of what this object was that she was impaled on, um, where he buried her. I mean, if this was a campus grounds, were they on concrete? I mean, we have to assume that they're around buildings of some kind. Did he notice that they were near the library or, you know, by a classroom, something along those lines? We are not getting anything in terms of details like that. Um, as a matter of fact, for the information that he's giving as a confession, it is super, super light in terms of detail. And then when we couple that up with looking at how they conducted their search, it seems like they really didn't get very good detail from him in terms of where she should have been buried. Um, I don't know, just something to consider as you're looking at, at all this. Now, things seem to change pretty rapidly. This is another article from January of 2010. Missing girl cold case solved after 25 years. Mom says no. Authorities in Northeast Florida say they've closed the 24-year-old case of a missing seventh grader, but the girl's mother says she doesn't believe it. She remains convinced that the 12-year-old was kidnapped. Pashan says the sheriff's office just wants the case closed. Authorities still haven't found her daughter's remains, though crews searched the site Lambert indicated in his recent interviews. Pashan told the Florida Times Union that Lambert, quote, makes up tales to get attention. Uh, and this is posted at abcnews.com. Outside of that, on January 7th, 2010, after confessing to 24-year-old killing, David Lambert recants. Now, there's another interesting twist in this whole thing in that for some reason, uh, the police gave the St. Augustine, the same paper that I've been referencing this whole episode, uh, gave them a piece of recorded interview with David Lambert. And they don't really even give a very good explanation of what this interview is. We can tell based on the timestamp that this happened, November 13th of 2009. Um, this is David sitting over here. This is one of the officers. Um, and then across from David, which you can't see on camera, is his mother. And quite honestly, I had to watch about half the video before I figured that out. Um, I couldn't really make out what she was saying. Of course, we've got a terrible camera angle, which I see frequently in these police videos for some reason. Uh, and then there's another uh, investigator sitting across the table over on this side. I watched literally this whole thing, uh, all 56 minutes of it. And there are a few strange things that happen in it. And it's weird because like I said, for the first half, I didn't really realize what this was. I thought this clip was him confessing. In a way it is, but it's not his original confession. If you recall right, they said that they were in there for about 20 hours with him. Obviously this video is only 56 minutes long. This video is him confessing to his mother. So there's this strange thing that happens in this video where for about six or seven minutes, the two investigators come in, they take him out and they're just gone. They just leave her on her own in this room for six or seven minutes. And then they come back and then he decides that he's going to confess to her. Um, this is 
part of what gives me trouble with this case because his confession here, once again, is omitting tons of detail. It's a very light type of confession. Uh, I felt weird that the investigators had to walk him out and talk to him for you know six or seven minutes first and then kind of bring him back in. But that's really before I realized that his mother was in the room. Um, even outside of all that, when I'm watching this video, I have this really bizarre feeling about what are the investigators doing here? Like, are they just deciding that they want to really help his mother understand that he truly did this, which I think would be the best of intentions? Or is there something else here? Because there's some dialogue that comes from these guys about uh, now you don't have to listen to other people. And now if you hear someone talking to you about this, you know that they're they're not right because we're telling you the truth here. You have to believe that what we're telling you here is the truth. I just... There's something about their motivation that I don't understand with this video. Outside of all that, uh, as was described by the article, there is this kind of weird, I don't know, I, I almost want to say sweetness. I just, I see that they're trying to help her in some way. I just don't know if I trust the information that they're giving her to try to help her. There is no physical evidence to support this. Um, they're, they're telling us that he came to a confession, but we're, get, we're really not given any details to really understand this confession very well or to be able to support it in any way. I do have to say, in looking at this video, it does seem like David goes through a period of being extremely uh, angsty and he's facing down a lot. And then after he speaks and he gets it all out, his demeanor does seem to change in this video. And that's one of the things that the officers kind of swear by, that they know based on how he confessed that he is indeed telling the truth. As a matter of fact, let me play just a little clip for you here of them stating just about that. Uh, now he and I were going to sit in this room until in my head and in my heart, I was 100% convinced that he had been honest with me. And he sat here until he did that. And it's not like Detective Cole said, it's not what he said. It's the emotion that accompanied what he said and the conviction in the way he said it. So them explaining it to his mother, they're even saying, look, we really don't have a lot of good information here, but based on the emotion we felt coming from David when he had his confession, we're convinced. And that is probably the thing that I have the most trouble with in terms of this whole case. I just, I struggle with this, guys. You know, we've talked about confessions before. False confessions do happen. We have a person here who has tried to confess to them before, um, gave them a completely different location for where the body is. Uh, and then later, years later, after this case gets handed off to different investigators, they come in and they decide that his confession to them, well, that must be the real one. But then after he confesses to them, yeah, he takes that back too, even though he finds out that he's never going to be charged for this. There is no fallout to him for doing this in either regard, for him lying about the fact that he killed his sister, or if he did really kill his sister, for him being honest to them, he's not going to serve any time. So what is the motivating factor here? I don't know. Is this a person that is just struggling with severe emotional disorders? Um, from a pretty messed up life. First of all, I think even he would agree with that. Um, I just, I really struggle with this, uh, especially after watching this video. The intent of this video is strange to me. Um, his intent is strange to me. If he really wanted to be honest with his mother about what happened so she could move forward, he essentially undid all of that as soon as he left the room here or with, within a matter of a couple months of him leaving the room here because we have articles in the press where he is recanting that confession, just like right here back at staugustine.com. A man who confessed to killing his sister in 1985 is now saying he only told detectives what they wanted to hear. And I just want to ask you guys to remember when we were talking about this earlier, they said that he was in there for 20 hours. And even at the end of that video where he's, where he's telling his mother, um, they are talking about, well, we can take you home now. So is he being kind of detained enough that this is turning into such a laborious thing that he's deciding, I'm just going to tell them whatever they want to hear so I can get out of this and go back home. I think we have to consider that. 
Uh, quote, there's no doubt about it, said Detective Sean Tice with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. He's 100% honest about where he buried her. If that's true, then where's the body? And I know we have this amazing excuse of, you know, yeah, well, the land has been has been raised at this point. Yeah, but you can't find anything I mean, we've looked into cases where people are able to find uh, fragments of humans many, many years after something like this. We can't, and you guys searched 20 acres supposedly, and you can't find anything. You had dogs all over that place. You can't find anything. Um, I don't know. I just, I struggle. I really, really struggle with it. In the video interview, you get a little bit more detail about what their thoughts are about what happened to her. They are assuming that when the buildings were leveled, that a bunch of that stuff was removed from the site and that she might have been removed with that stuff. Is it possible? I think it's certainly possible. Um, but I just don't know that it's enough for me to all of a sudden say case closed. And especially when you consider the history of this guy telling them stories, which there is a history of here. Why are you going to decide, oh, this is the story we believe. This is the one. Go ahead and freeze it. Let's let's get all this done. Close the case and blah, blah, blah. And then, by the way, later he's saying, no, that's not true. Well, too bad. Case is closed. I don't know. I don't know if that's enough for some of us out here. At the end of a series of interviews that began in August, David Lambert, now 38 years old, told detectives that he and his sister were at the abandoned Florida Memorial College when they got into a quarrel over change from $20. He told detectives that she punched him and he shoved her. She fell backwards. You guys have, have heard this before. Uh, he says that he first called out for help, but no one responded. Uh, he said he didn't run home to tell his parents because he feared that Howard and Margaret Lambert would have killed him, according to Tice's report. Instead, he picked up a broken piece of road sign and dug a three-foot grave in the sandy ground. Uh, it's not what he said. It's how he said it, said Skip Cole. Um, that's what people need to understand. It was real emotion. And that is super subjective. Lambert said he told Tyson Cole what they wanted to hear. Quote, they didn't want to hear the truth, he said. Tice pointed out that Lambert was the one who most often volunteered information about the case. When he was picked up in 2000 on a worthless check warrant, Lambert said he told officers, I need to get this off my chest. I'm responsible for my sister's death, said Tice. He told officers at the time that he had buried his sister at the pits, the Coquina mine on Holmes Boulevard, Tice added. He was not charged because no body was found. So here we're getting him talking about a completely different location. Yes, it's on Holmes Boulevard, um, but still no body found at that location. And that was back in 2000 when they were checking that much closer to the time frame. He was not charged after his most recent admission because a statute of limitations was in effect for manslaughter in 1985. Cadaver dogs searched the site and showed a behavioral change near the spot mapped out by Lambert, said Tice. The area was excavated with no results. The grave may have vanished in the mid-1990s when a tract was excavated for a planned Holmes Boulevard widening project, which by the way, I took a look here. This is Holmes Boulevard. Does that look like it's been widened to you? It's only two lanes. It's only one lane in each direction. Uh, I don't think that this was widened at all. Now, if he's saying they were planning on widening it, widening it and they processed some of the ground over here, um, that certainly might be possible. They would have been really close to the road when she got hurt. I'm really surprised no one would have seen that. Uh, I'm really surprised that in that shallow of a grave, no one might have noticed that something was wrong in that area. If it is this close to the road, a, free, a place where it looks like it's basically a walkway for people that are coming by. Uh, you've got a bunch of people that are essentially living in this area through the 90s, prostitution, drug dealers. No one is coming across the remains of this little girl. No one. They're saying that the excavation for the planned Holmes Boulevard widening project basically ran right down where the dogs changed their behavior, which to me, um, you know, I've, I've looked into a lot of cases. We've had a lot of uh, dogs pop up in these cases. I've never referred to it. I've never heard it referred to like this, that they've changed their behavior. I've heard they got a hit and here we're not even getting that. So we've basically got a confession 
that can't really be substantiated with any physical evidence that is later recanted, was kind of previously recanted when he obviously, obviously one of these times he's lied. She, she can't have been in both locations. She can't have been at the pit and at the college. So why do we believe him now? So we can close this case out so we can get his mom to stop complaining about it in the press and making the department look bad or something along those lines. I really don't know. I don't know. Um, I've got several other links to this that you could look at in the more info section down below, but that is the gist of it. And I got to tell you guys, even after going through this again with you here today, I am completely stuck. I don't know where to go with this case. Um, do I think that he did something to her? I think it's probably likely he did something to her. I don't think we're getting the truth out of him one way or the other. And that's part of what I'm struggling with here. Um, the detail doesn't really line up. Um, you know, there's nothing physical we could point to to say, oh yeah, he's telling the truth. Look at this here. We're not hearing detail from the cops about, uh, you know, specifics about what happened here outside of she got pushed, something impaled her. We don't know what type of object that is. Uh, what kind of road sign was it that he used to dig three feet deep? Uh, why didn't that mark up his hands? Why didn't the police officer that spoke to him that day check out his hand and say, hey, it looks like you've been digging. What's What's been going on? Hey, your hands look like they're, they're cut up because you've been handling a, a, a metal sign trying to use it as a shovel. I mean, none of that was ever noted. I'm really struggling with this one. And I'm, I'm basically back at the same at the same point. I couldn't do this as an episode of Case Cracked because I can't tell you how they cracked the case. I can tell you they've got a confession that if we look at the history of how this guy talks to the police is weak at best. And you've got cops that are insisting, nope, he's telling the truth because of how emotional he was. They're being human lie detectors. It just doesn't hold up for me. It's not enough. I don't know. Does it help at this point? Um, to have a even a half truth to hopefully help his mother move forward is that kind of where the cops are coming from? Maybe, you know. Um, I don't think this accident scenario is realistic. I, I don't think that it happened like that. Was it something more nefarious? Did he? Was there some type of other abuse going on there that she was being? subject to from her brother? Or did he lash out to her in some much bigger ways? There's another interesting thing in that video um, where the cops are talking about how close he was with her. And he starts going down this road of, no, nah, we weren't really that close. Nah, we weren't really. And even, even an article that I read you guys mentioned about how close these two were. Uh, even his mother has specifically mentioned about how close these two were. But when he's sitting in that room with the cops and he's talking about the fact that he might have had a hand in her death, all of a sudden, nah, we weren't really that close. Yeah, we were siblings, but we weren't that close. Uh, this guy talks out both sides of his mouth. I don't know which side to believe, but I know I wouldn't trust him for the truth in any case. So how did that happen here? I really don't know. Case cracked? Not for me. Case still open? I don't know. I really don't know how they could process this any further. I think the investigators are coming from a good place. I just don't know if closing out this case is the best thing uh, for the community for, their, for her mother in particular, who doesn't seem to be buying this anyway. Um, I just, I don't know what the benefit is outside of these guys potentially trying to be nice guys and trying to lead the mother down a road of um, healing, which they, they do mention in the video. Um, and I did get a, a pretty good feeling in the video that they were really trying to be helpful in particular to the mother. Uh, it didn't feel like they were trying to, you know, screw over David to make sure that they got a better confession so they could try to nail him with some charges. There, were, It just wasn't that type of energy. Watch the video for yourself. I'll have a link to it down below. Uh, maybe by the time you get to the end of that, you'll be able to call it a, a case cracked. Um, I just, I couldn't after doing it. Really tough one, guys. Uh, thank you so much for hanging with me on this one. And once again, thank you to Christy Strasinger for giving me something else to scratch my brain on. Um, I don't think this case is going to leave me anytime soon. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I do hope that her family is able to heal. I don't know that this attempt at it is going to be the thing to do it. It, it seems like... Um, 
it seems like it's going to take more than a couple of investigators that might be kind-hearted trying to help here. I think it's going to take like years of therapy uh, by, by you know, a very well-qualified therapist that really cares about this family. And I just don't know that they have those types of resources. So <sighs> take care, everyone. Uh, hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. And I will see you back here on the Lord and Arch channel on Monday. 